number 13, fisherman deaths in 2006. In January of 2006, two fishermen were consumed by the deadly perils of North Sentinel Island. Sundaraj and Pandit Tiwari were illegally harvesting crabs off the island's coast when their boat drifted into the shallow waters. At nighttime, their improvised anchor failed and the boat floated with the current. Passing fishermen tried to warn Raj and Tiwari, but received no response at they most likely fallen asleep. Soon enough, the men got close enough to the shore that they were approached by the Sentinelese, the island's native inhabitants. Most past attempts at contacting the tribe had been met with violent resistance as they seemed to fully reject the outside world. This wouldn't be an exception. A group of Sentinelese warriors armed with axes approached the boat and butchered the fishermen. According to one source, the bodies were later mounted on bamboo sticks facing the sea like scarecrows, presumably as a warning. Several days later, a helicopter from the Indian Coast Guard found that the bodies had been buried and attempted to retrieve them. As the aircraft approached the island, it was met with a barrage of spears and arrows launched by the Sentinelese. The helicopter had to abandon its mission. Number 12. Death of John Allen Chow The 2018 killing of missionary John Allen Chow reignited global fascination with the Sentinelese tribe. In November of that year, fully aware of the dangers ahead, the 26-year-old went to North Sentinel determined to convert his tribe to Christianity. He didn't get the required permits and bribed local fishermen to take him within 1,600 to 2,300 feet of the shore. From that point on, Chow kayaked towards the island in spite of the fishermen's warnings. His attempts to interact with the tribe were met with a combination of bewilderment, amusement, and hostility. Upon first making contact, they approached Chow with bows drawn as he told them that he was there by the authority of Jesus Christ. Chow gifted them with fish and quickly paddled away, but would later return to the island. A journal entry from November the 15th, 2018 describes how he was shot at by the Sentinelese. While closing in on the North Shore, he attempted communication by replicating their shouts, but the Sentinelese burst into laughter. He approached them with gifts in the form of scissors, hooks, tweezers, fishing lines, safety pins, and other items. As Chow got out of his kayak to hand over the gifts, a young woman and a child approached him with their bows drawn. Chow thought it would be the end, so he started preaching and singing worship songs. Then the child shot a metal-headed arrow that struck the waterproof Bible he was holding near his chest. The tribe took the gifts and his kayak, but allowed the missionary to waddle through broken coral and then swim away. After this interaction with the Sentinelese, Chow would refer to the island as Satan's last stronghold. Scared and desperate, Chow refused to give up on what he believed was his mission. On November the 17th, he instructed the fishermen to leave without him as he made his way to the tribal settlements once more. The next day, the men saw Chow's lifeless body on the shore. Six fishermen were later arrested for breaching the perimeter and bringing the missionary close to the island. Despite efforts on behalf of Indian authorities, his remains were never recovered. Number 11. Legal Implications In the aftermath of the 2006 and 2018 killings, there were polarizing views about whether or not the Sentinelese should be prosecuted. It remains a difficult conversation since it involves subjecting an uncontacted tribe to the conventional law of modern society. The crux of the matter is that the Sentinelese people have made it abundantly clear that they want to be left alone. Those who ventured towards the coast in recent years knew they were doing it illegally and were aware of the dangers. This was also reflected by what Chow wrote in his journal. Please do not be angry at them or at God if I get killed. Don't retrieve my body. According to the Protection of Aboriginal Tribes Act of 1956, it's illegal to make contact with the Sentinelese or even get within five nautical miles of North Sentinel's coast. Researchers and anthropologists who want to do so need to get proper permission from the Indian government. North Sentinel is a sovereign place under its protection and the laws that have been put in place prevent the authorities from prosecuting the remote tribe. The government resumes its activity to remote monitoring and there's constant armed patrol to prevent outsiders from reaching the island. In Chow's case, the US government didn't ask Indian officials to press charges, nor was the tribe prosecuted for the 2006 killing of Raj and Tiwari. Number 10. 
location. North Sentinel is one of the Andaman Islands, which form an archipelago in the Bay of Bengal, located in the northeastern part of the Indian Ocean. At about 23 square miles, the island is roughly the size of Manhattan in New York City. After the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake, a tectonic plate was tilted under the island, thus exposing large portions of the surrounding coral reefs. They subsequently became dry land or shallow lagoons and connected North Sentinel with Constant Islet, a forested patch of land off the southeast coastline. Aerial expeditions were carried out to assess the damage the tsunami had caused to the island and its inhabitants. Despite massive tectonic changes, the Sentinelese had remained miraculously unscathed. To this day, North Sentinel's inhabitants remain shrouded in mystery and most of what is known about them stems from speculation and limited observation. Number 9. Andamanese People The Sentinelese belongs to the larger group of Andamanese people of which only roughly 450 remain. Other tribes include the Great Andamanese, the Onga, the Jarawa and the Jangil, a people extinct for roughly a century. The Sentinelese is the only tribe who has consistently refused contact with the outside world and the only one still living in their original homeland. Towards the end of the 18th century, a time when the other Andamanese began to have sustained contact with outsiders, their numbers were close to 7,000. As time passed, loss of territory, violence and disease wiped out most of them. It isn't known whether the Sentinelese isolation and reluctance is a reaction to seeing their neighbors dwindle in numbers. Number 8. Stone Age Civilization The Sentinelese has been described as a Stone Age civilization, as many of their practices haven't evolved for tens of thousands of years. Some reports claim that they lived in isolation for nearly 60,000 years with little changes to their lifestyle during this time. They've maintained a hunter-gatherer society and aren't known to engage in agriculture. It's still rather unclear to what extent they use fire. They hunt with bows and catch local seafood. There are some similarities to neighboring tribes. Like the Onga, they make canoes, the two being the only Andamanese tribes known to do so. They use long poles to propel the canoes, which are suitable for lagoon fishing and rarely used for navigating to other islands. The markings on their bows are similar to those of the Jarawa, and like them, the Sentinelese sleep on the ground. The uncontacted tribe has understood the value of metal and will scavenge it to cold forge weapons and tools. It's believed that they've mainly sourced their metal from shipwrecks on the island's coast. The axes and metal arrowheads are larger and heavier than those of other tribes in the region. This would seem to underline the prowess of Sentinelese warriors, as well as their readiness to take on invaders. Judging by the fact that Chow was shot at by a child, one might deduce that the young engage in hunting as well as warfare. Number 7. Society the tribe's adults are shorter in stature than the average human and researchers place their height between 5 foot 3 inches and 5 foot 5 inches. The difference may be explained as the result of genetic heritage, nutrition or insular dwarfism. The Sentinelese have been described as having well-aligned teeth and a dark, shining black skin color. Their muscles are well developed and very prominent. It's unknown what they call themselves and their language, which is unclassified, remains a mystery. It doesn't seem to overlap with any other in the Andamanese linguistic register. According to Chow's notes, the Sentinelese communicated through a multitude of high-pitched sounds. They live in temporary shelters, which are typically placed on four poles and feature slanted leaf-covered roofs. They are mostly naked as both the men and women only wear bark strings as well as ornaments in the form of headbands and necklaces. It's been reported that they sometimes wear the jawbones of deceased relatives. Their weapons feature engravings of geometric designs and shade contrasts, and the men often have daggers tucked in their waist belts. It's still unclear how many people live on the island, but common estimates range between 50 and 200. From the earliest recorded contact to the 21st century, there have been several violent interactions between the Sentinelese and outsiders. Number 6. Early Contact In 1771, Diligent, a passing ship from the East India Company, first mentioned the island and noted lights upon the shore. Almost a century later, an Indian merchant vessel ran aground on the coast of North Sentinel. The crew and passengers safely made their way to the beach. On the third day, they were suddenly attacked with arrows 
by the island's inhabitants. The captain, who had fled in the lifeboat, was later picked up by a sailing vessel. The Royal Navy then sent rescuers to the island, who subsequently found the survivors. They'd managed to repel the initial attack with sticks and stones. Fortunately for them, the islanders didn't return. Number 5. Interaction in Colonial Times In 1880, Officer Maurice Vidal Portman of the Royal Navy attempted to establish contact with the Sentinelese. As a colonial administrator of the archipelago, he'd pacified previously hostile Andamanese tribes, particularly the Onga. He led a group of Andamanese trackers and armed Europeans to the island. The inhabitants retreated into the tree line and abandoned their settlements. Portman's expedition captured four Sentinelese children as well as an elderly man and woman. They were taken to Port Blair, the archipelago's capital city. Shortly after they arrived, the adults died and the children became ill. Portman was quick to return them to the island, along with gifts, still hoping to establish friendly contact. This was never achieved, and the children most likely related the presumably alien experience to the others. Some have blamed the tribe's aggression towards outsiders on the way Portman had handled the interaction. The officer returned to the island several times, but the islanders always remained hidden. In 1896, a convict from a prison colony used an improvised raft to reach the island. A search party later found him with a sliced throat and arrow wounds. Richard Karnak Temple, chief commissioner of the Andaman Islands from 1895 to 1904, described the Sentinelese as a tribe which slays every stranger, however inoffensive, on sight, whether a forgotten member of itself, of another Andamanese tribe, or a complete foreigner. Number 4. Primrose In August of 1981, the Primrose, a cargo ship with a small crew, was caught in rough seas and became stranded near the North Sentinel coast. A few days later, armed islanders prepared canoes to attack the ship. The captain sent out a mayday asking for weapons. Strong waves prevented the Sentinelese from reaching the Primrose and deflected the arrows they fired. The crew spent almost a week stranded, terrified that their lives would be claimed by the tribe. They were ultimately rescued by a civilian helicopter, assisted by the Indian Navy. Over the course of the months that followed, the Sentinelese scoured the shipwreck for metal. Scrap dealers contracted to dismantle the Primrose wreck reported regular visits by the Sentinelese over the course of the 18 months they worked at the site. They noted that their interacting was limited but without incident, as the Sentinelese were mainly interested in collecting iron. Number 3. T. N. Pandit In 1974, a team of anthropologists and filmmakers from National Geographic visited the island to film a documentary entitled Man in Search of Man. They were bearing gifts and planned to establish friendly contact over the course of several days. As the motorboat broke through the reefs, the Sentinelese shot arrows at it. The crew managed to reach the beach and left gifts that included, among others, aluminium cookware, a plastic doll, and a live pig. Another barrage of arrows then followed, one of which struck the documentary's director in the thigh. The Sentinelese man responsible for the hit could be heard laughing proudly as he retreated behind a tree. Others speared the doll and the pig and buried them in the sand. The expedition yielded the first photograph of the Sentinelese, which was presented in the National Geographic magazine as a people for whom arrows speak louder than words. Anthropologist T.M. Pandit was a member of the documentary expedition and he'd earned a reputation as an expert advisor during the 1970s and 1980s. He was the first professional anthropologist to visit the island in 1967 and had been assisting various parties who were hoping to establish friendly contact. Pandit noted that the Sentinelese accepted the many gifts brought to them, but also mentioned violent encounters. Sometimes, they'd rush to take the gifts only to then suddenly fire arrows at contact parties. Pandit noted that they sometimes wave, but at other times make obscene gestures, such as assuming defecating postures or swaying their penises. Yet Pandit's gift-giving expeditions paved the way for a rather successful interaction. Official They Will Kill You merchandise is now available at theywillkillyou.com. Some of it is to die for. Number 2. Peaceful Contact, 1991 The anthropological expedition of 1991 is, to date, the most peaceful encounter between the Sentinelese and outsiders. Madhumala, Chattopadhyay, 
an anthropologist with the team, is often referred to as the first woman to have made contact with the tribe. On January the 4th, the Sentinelese for the first time approached visitors unarmed. They accepted the coconuts they'd been offered and got close to the dinghies as the exchanges were carried out hand to hand. One anthropologist noted the milestone that having been touched by the Sentinelese represented. Pandit Anne Madhomala returned on February the 24th and the peaceful interaction continued. A series of contact expeditions continued until 1994 and beyond, but saw no significant progress in learning more about the isolated Sentinelese. The tribe wouldn't allow visitors to get close to them, and most often gifts were left on the beach without any islanders making their presence known. Number 1. Further Contact The Sentinelese are among the world's last uncontacted tribes. The population has been designated a scheduled tribe and a particularly vulnerable tribal group. Most experts advise against any further contact attempts for the visitors' protection, but mainly for that of the tribe itself. The immune systems of the Sentinelese are unprepared for the diseases that modern humans can bring to their island. It's been argued that there's currently no way of integrating them into the modern world without the threat of wiping out the entire population. The argument seems to be reflected and reinforced by what has happened to the other Andamanese tribes after they opened themselves to outsiders. Through past and recent interactions, the Sentinelese people have made it violently clear that they have no interest of sharing their island interacting with outsiders or being part of another society except their own. Thanks for watching. Would you rather attempt to establish contact with the Sentinelese or live in North Korea for a year? Let us know in the comments section below.